Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest Family Business United Insight into the challenges and some of the behind the scenes tours of some family firms across the UK. I'm delighted this morning to be joined by Chris Black, who is the Manager Director of Sound Leisure up in Leeds. So without further ado, Chris, do you want to just introduce yourself and explain a little bit about what you do, and then we'll come to some more of the heritage and, and the questions behind the business? Yeah, no problem. Morning. Uh, thank you for having me on. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sound Leisure, we're a family-based manufacturer. Uh, we're in Leeds, uh, so the business was set up in 1978 by my father. Uh, we are mainly known for manufacturing the machines that you can see behind me now, which are based on sort of like the classic jukeboxes from the 1940s and 50s. Um, in addition to manufacturing the classic jukeboxes, we also operate jukeboxes and background music systems throughout the UK. So we've probably got about 1,000 sites, um, or we did have prior to March. Uh, the, the world's changed, obviously, so the, the, that side suffered quite a lot through the, the lockdowns. Um, we have a children's play division. Um, which supplies children's distraction areas. So we're not doing the big play barn type things. We we actually supply to waiting rooms. So if you go to any hospital, NHS is a large um, user of our equipment. Places like supermarkets, ferry companies, motorway services, just the little B tree areas, little tables and things that the toddlers can play on. So that side's been hit. Um, and then we've got an R&D team, uh, a division that works not only for sound leisure because we're constantly innovating and changing, but we also offer their services out to other businesses as well. So within the business, we have our own metal workshop, our own woodworking shop, our own pattern making, tool making, uh, plastics division. We do our own electronics assembly and design. We've got our own creative people. Uh, and then obviously we've got the, the installation teams, the service engineers, and the, the actual factory that builds everything that you can see, takes all the components from the metal, woodwork, plastic, etc., and builds it into one of the iconic machines that you can see behind me. It's a fantastic, Chris. It's a fantastic story. And I, I've been, I was lucky enough to come and see you pre-lockdown um, at uh, the yeah. factory, which is, is fantastic. I mean, they are just they're just beautiful machines, but actually they're almost a, a blast, blast from the past, but been brought up to the modern day. And we'll come on to that a bit later on. And, and I should say to anyone I'm watching this now, I will post the webinar later, but also a link to a bit of a history where there's, a, there's some filming of the factory and the manufacturing process. So get more of an insight from the what you do on a daily basis but let's go back to the very beginning and it was created by your father or your father was part of the, the starting of the business can you explain how we got into making jukeboxes <laughs> um yeah i mean my dad's always been um probably a whiz kid if you want um he's been very technically astute since his early days so even when he was 12 or 13 he used to manufacture valve radios and repair the amplifiers for people that he knew where he lived. Um, he would admit that he was a bit of a wild child. I think he probably went to more schools in Leeds than anybody <laughs> else because he kept uh, being invited to leave, I believe. Um, so he wasn't an academic, um, but he was extremely intelligent. Uh, technically, he probably he's probably one of the best guys our industry has ever seen, if not the best. And he got involved with various people through college and through the polytechnics that he did end up at in Leeds. Um, one man in particular asked him to look at an electronics <clears throat> component or a board. Um, he was bringing machines in from America. And he knew my father was at Polytechnic and he asked him if he could have a look at this particular board. And my dad had not seen anything like it. Took it to college to see his uh, tutor and said, look, I don't know what this is. I'm obviously not at this level. Can you tell me what this is? This tutor took one look at it and said, I don't know what the hell that is. Where have you found that? Has it dropped from space? So at that point, he had a, an attraction or an, infinity, or an affinity with um, the, the jukeboxes because he thought if this industry was so far advanced, that is something that he wanted to look at. Now, there's a good side to that, that yes, you're always playing with the modern technologies. There's also a downside to it, that it's an evolving industry. And from the outside, it doesn't always look like that because it starts it off with obviously vinyl records that we were using vinyl either on a cylinder or a 78 or a 45 or a 33 and a third. 
for probably a hundred years. <clears throat> but then everything just went crazy and CD came out and digital came out. And it's been a constant since I've been with the business 34 years. It, it, we've never sat still and, and and i think that's part of it Every, everybody's been innovating so my father got involved with the jukeboxes from a very early stage as i say going back to your question um and he ended up working for businesses throughout the north of england um was intending to go to south africa where he'd worked for two or three years introducing jukeboxes to the market over there and we were all as a family about to move there in 1972 and then my brother was born and he had some difficulties when he was born and my mother wanted to have him sorted out in the UK rather than in a country where she she'd never been to and we ended up staying here so that changed his game plan and eventually he once I got the opportunity he decided that literally living out of the back of a van which is what he was doing traveling up and down the country week after week um, probably got a bit too much. I think my mum probably had an influence in that with two young children. And uh, he decided to set the business up, which he did in 1978. And uh, here we are now, 42 years later. Um, we've changed a lot. Um, it was mainly commercial machines we were building for pubs and clubs. That was the intention when he got started. And we we really took that market and we he, he, he successfully launched the first British so like fully designed and manufactured jukebox. Um, nowadays, we're more selling to private individuals. So 90% of everything we manufacture now ends up in somebody's front room or the kitchen or the games room, bar, et cetera. And we also export between 60 and 75% of everything that we manufacture as well. So it's, it's changed over the years, but I think with any manufacturing company or with any business that's been around that long, and especially when you see what's happened with years like this year, you, you've got to just keep innovating and thinking on your feet and uh, to get through every day, really. It's a, it's a fantastic story. And I, I know I've heard about the story before. And there's, there's a lot in just in terms of what you've just said. Um, the entrepreneurial nature of your father, who I've met, who's a very humble man, very quiet, very unassuming, but has created this fantastic business, which you, you're now taking on. Um, through to the role, to be fair, the role of your mother in terms of helping shape where it was based and how it grew. So there's, there's lots in there. How did you, so growing up, you were aware of what was going on um, in terms of, how did you then get involved in terms of, you're now the MD, but how did you get involved with, with, with Stand Leisure? Well, I remember really, I mean, I was eight when the business was formed. So I, I remember going down to sort of like the garage where it started and knocking around with my dad while I was trying to clear the mess that it sort of like taken on um his, his first building was literally a loading bay um for one of the guys that he set the business up with initially uh with eddie and he had a, a loading bay and i remember going down there and wading through the boxes and looking up through through the ceiling at the sky i can i can remember that i mean it, it wasn't uh any there was, there was no luxury at all in where he set up i think he had 50 pounds in his pocket and that was it now i always ended up very much like my father um i wasn't an academic uh didn't particularly like school i went through the 80s with the teacher strikes and it was i think i spent more time in the local snooker hall when we were kicked out on an afternoon um to go do something for a few hours while the teachers were on strike so i got through i really i'm more of a practical person so i wanted to go off and be a painter and a decorator to be honest finished school at 16 ran out of the gates couldn't wait to get out of school um and i had six weeks holidays to work out or to sort myself out for the painting and decorating course that was going on and uh, i remember driving down york road in leeds with my mum and dad and my dad said look i need you to come to work we need you to come and do some things in the factory and the rest is history yeah i mean he, he he said look there's a lot to do there but if you want to go do painting and decorating that's what you can do but just come and have a look and that six weeks as i say has turned into 34 years it's been a long summer holiday um <laughs> but it's been an enjoyable one 
And is your son, because you're the next generation, you've got a son who I know when I came up was, was starting to get his, his hands involved and get more involved. Is he, is he still involved? Is he looking to get more involved? Yeah, I mean, I've got two sons, but I also work with my wife. My wife's running the operating division. Um, my brother's here as well. So Michael, he joined probably about 20 years ago now. Uh, so Michael had a different path. He went down the university. Um, he got a first degree in design at Sheffield. So he came to join us and he's involved now with the R&D team and trying to work out on some of the new designs of the machines. Although they look like you've alluded to already, they, they look like the old 1940s and 50s. There's, there's quite a lot of design work gone into it to make it look like that. And Michael runs that team. My, that wasn't my, meant as a criticism, by the way. That wasn't meant no, as a criticism. No, no, I understand that. <laughs> That's it. No, we're, we're, we're proud to say they do look like the originals. We like to say we refine the icons. Um, but my eldest son is here. Um, he is working um, in the factory. He works in the digital side, repairing the commercial machines. But he also, like anybody with a family business, he gets dragged off all over the place. If, if we're working on a weekend at an exhibition, I'll drag Alex in and He's great with people. Um, it is, in fact, he's is, is getting too good, to be honest. People actually tend to gravitate towards him more than me now. So he's taking, taking some weight off my shoulders. But we've got him on a business uh, management course with uh, Hull University, which he was supposed to start in uh, September. But that's been put through till January now. So it's been put back till January. So we'll see what happens there. Um, and I think... I mean, Alex has done really well because he's come in once again from school. He's a bit similar to me. He's, he's not he's not scared of working, but he's not an academic. Um, he'll get his, his sleeves rolled up. We've had a pop-up shop in Leeds uh, for three or four times over the last two years. And he'll just work all day long and all night long. And he's, he's got that family business ethic, which if it needs to be done, let's just get on with it and, and do it and don't complain, which is... For me, he's a great trait in somebody. And it's great to see there are, there are lots of family members, and I know I've met most of them, and that it's, it's a joy to see you working together. And the product, a traditional product, but you've really brought into the 21st century. And, and I think listening to you when you talk about the evolution of the business over 38, 40 years, you've been through some major changes because, as you say, vinyl became CD, pubs changed the, the smoking rule, so less people were necessarily going to pubs and standing at the bar listening to their jukeboxes. And then you've got COVID come or the pandemic's just happened, you've got Brexit on. So your business has always been fighting and having to be entrepreneur, but you've been kind of on like a roller coaster, haven't you? Of every time you get to a plateau, there's another another really serious challenge to where you are in your status quo. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's probably something to do with the industry that we're in. Um, I think the pub industry over the last 20 years has well, like you say, it's been a roller coaster. We've had the smoking bans, you had things like Sky TV. Strangely enough that nobody can complain about, you had the drink driving. Um, so, I mean, when I started, everybody used to go to the pub, have a few pints and drive home. That that was the first thing. Um, and it, it's, what shall I say, it's matured in a way. There's always some casual twist. It just seems to be the, the, the jukebox side of it. It's always been a big casualty because the smoking banning, I think that was 2007, that had a big impact. Um, because people got to a stage there where Sky TV was becoming more prevalent. They were saying, look, if we, we can stay at home, we can stay at home, we can smoke, we can drink cheaper, we can watch sports on TV, we'll get people around. Um, in a way, we, we looked at that and it did bring up a new opportunity because we set the children's play division up at mm. the same time because we were thinking the, the tap rooms are closed, the pubs just have to do something different to bring clientele in. And it may go child-led or food-led, and which is what's happened with the majority of the sites. And we we did really well. And the, the children's play division took off. Initially, Michael ran it. Then we brought Kath, my wife, in to give us a hand because it got to a stage where it was growing so big so quickly that we had to shut it down and concentrate on what we were doing mm. or build it and grow it and do it professionally and we brought Kath in and she helped and then we brought sales people in and, and that side's grown and grown until COVID hit in March and that side literally is on ice at the moment because I said the NHS is the largest customer uh, strangely enough they've had a bit more on the minds for uh, the last six or eight months um, and then other 
industries such as the um, ferry industries, where we're just getting going with there. We were just looking at some big deals, uh, but that's all been turned to freight now. Um, so strangely enough, wagon drivers don't want to play with kids' toys. So <laughs> that's uh, put the nail in that one. But look, that will come back. Uh, we're, we're positive that will come back. We just have to ride that one out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we've always had challenges, but I think as a business, we are used to those challenges. Um, that's probably in a way what makes it exciting. I mean, I don't say it out loud too much, but although we've had a real tough six months, it's been a fun six months in a way um, because we have had to get up every morning and think, right, what we're going to do, how we're going to use these people, what we're going to manufacture to get through this month. And we've done all sorts. I mean, I can't even tell you about some of the stuff we've manufactured, but it is... Uh, We've joined the cars, let's say, and um, we've turned our skills to all sorts of different things and we're still here. Who knows what's around the corner, but I, I will say that whatever does happen and none of us know with businesses really with Brexit and with what's going on, we don't know how long this will last for, but we'll give it a good shot and we, we, will, we won't go down without a fight. And uh, the intention is to keep battling through every day and um, employing the amount of people that we've got now. And you obviously from Leeds, Yorkshire based, the community is really important to you, isn't it, in terms of giving back and actually supporting your local community. And that's part of the ethos of really who you are. Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, I, I think we've got our family uh, in this business. My mother did work here as well um, until me and Kath had kids and she retired to look after our kids so Kath could come in but we've also probably got seven or eight other families that work within the business so we've, we've got a team of between 70 and 80 people um, depending on sort of like the time of year as well but you can see we've got a car team of 75 people um, I know there's at least seven families there um, we probably were up to nine two or three years ago but we do have people now and again want to retire for some reason um, and uh, <laughs> They, they've just left the, the kids here or the niece and nephew here. So the, the, there is a, a family feel which is good. Um, that gets you through times like this because sometimes you do have to ask a little bit extra of people. And I think they understand that we've always sort of like treated everybody as family. And sometimes we have to go through the rough times together. Um, we can't give everybody everything they need, but that then gets paid back when we can. So I think the tough thing at the minute is we've been through a rough probably two or three years because we've had Brexit hanging over us. Um, so that's affected sales, especially last year throughout Europe. Um, this year was the year where we thought we've got a good 10 months really of PR, just let's crack on and build the coffers up again and get going. Obviously, the, the rug got pulled from under our feet somewhat, um, but we're, we're doing all right. We, we also spend a lot of time working with the local schools, local UTCs, the University Technical Colleges. Um, we have some great um, partnerships with them. So when we're allowed to, we have school visits around the factory. We run competitions for designs. We uh, send, we, we actually work with some of the teachers uh, with the school curriculum to bring design in to the children or to the students that actually means something. There's nothing worse than being at school. I mean, that, I think that's probably why I got turned off quite a lot, that you're doing things and you don't understand what the end game is. Whereas if they can actually walk around the factory and we can say, look, if you can design this or you can do this, this is what it will do. Um, this is the part that you will use and we can send a machine down afterwards and show the, the, the students what they've designed or what they've been involved with. It brings it to life and it, it and it opens up so many doors for people that it's um, we, we've got a few students now that we've met when they were 16 and 17 at the UTC that are actually now working in the factory um, that have asked to come and work for us because they've enjoyed it so much. So that's that's a really nice feeling to get that, that you can see yeah. that you, you have had an effect on people. And it's and it's a fan, it is a fantastic product, and it looks beautiful. The, 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 the range is, is amazing, but they look beautiful. And the fact you've transformed them into modern pieces that can go into these luxurious homes and and be integrated into a new a new thing is it just shows the strength of the diversification. Um, where do you see it going in the future, Chris? In terms, of, I know this has been a really difficult year. Actually, you no, know, let's step back. Step back once. This has been a difficult year for many businesses, an exporter, a manufacturer. You personally, I know, have had coronavirus, and so. 
um, are one of the few people that I know that have had it and, and survived and you're back at work, which is fantastic. But, but what have been the biggest challenges running a business with all of that going on? I think, well, the, it, it was March was an interesting month. Um, I was working in the shop in Leeds with my brother on the Sunday, um, probably middle of March, and felt great. Other than I cycled in for the first time in a while because I'd not been out on my bike, we'd been that busy. Cycled to the shop 12 miles, cycled home, thought, wow, I need to get out on my bike a bit more. I'm feeling a bit tired after that one. I don't know what's going on. Came to the office Monday, everything was fine. Uh, and then lunchtime started to feel a bit iffy. And went, I said to Kath, I said, I'm, I'm going home. I said, I'm done for. I've worked too many weekends in the shop. I need a break. Went home, went to bed and got out of bed two weeks later. But with COVID, um, when I got out of bed, I couldn't even walk around the bed. I was that wiped out. Um, took me five weeks to get over that. Um, but in the meantime, because I'd had it, I'd taken Michael out, who's a diabetic, so he couldn't come into the business. Kath obviously was isolated, and so was my son. So literally, I took three key members of the team out in one hit. Um, left my father here, trying to work out what the hell was going on with everybody, and it was it was a mad time. Um, we got through it. Um, I think. As we're looking now, um, you look back and you think, like everybody else, I mean, everybody's gone through different uh, scenarios. I think our business, because it's so diverse, it's been literally for the first time like running three or four separate companies at once. Normally, they all gel and they all, yeah. they've all got some kind of interaction, but every division has been hit completely differently. So for the first time being an exporter, didn't really help us because the whole world shut down. So we had four people left in the factory to get an order out to China. And we literally said, if we can get that order out, um, that'll give us some cash to get us through a couple of months, which was yeah. what we thought it was going to be. That would help us through. So we got the order to China out and then shut everything down. Um, June and our uh, what we were in May and June, um, Kath was talking to all sorts of people with, from PPE. Um, we we did all sorts. As I say, I can't say online what we what we manufactured. I'm under an NDA, but let's just say it was an interesting and varied production line that we had going. Um, and it well, that's got strength to you, isn't it? That's strength to you, and, and and similar to other family firms where you're flexible, adaptable, and you respond. Um, and, yeah, and the team I think come together, so. not just not just the family, but your staff, which are part of your your bigger family, all come together to to yeah. make it work. And I think they all worked. And and I think like everybody else, we've seen members of the team where prior to lockdown were shining stars, and they sort of like fell into a hole and just were scared stiff to come out. We had other people that were at a lower level who became superstars that just were just like right, let's go do all this. We all want a job, and let's all jump in and help. And so I think like everybody you speak to, especially in manufacturing, it's been a an enlightening phase, let's say. It also, for us, gave us time to sit down and look at the business and say, look, this bit really has been struggling for quite a while. Uh, yeah. This bit's flying. Why are we spending so much time trying to get this bit going? Let's just look at this and try and move those people from there to there. And so in a way, it was a, a bit of a... A break for everybody just to try and once you got over the initial probably four or five weeks where we were where I was ill I was still, I mean I've just cleared all my emails down I'm just caught up enough to clear my emails down I think I actually had one day where I didn't do an email or a response to somebody but I think it gave people just that time just to sit down and reflect on what we were doing and where we were going and talk to various members of the team and say, right, what do we need to do and where do we need to go for this next six months? And we're still in that now. We we literally sat down last week and said, look, we're, we're still firefighting in some areas. Yeah, um, That's not all our fault. We've got suppliers that aren't open. We've got short supplies of all sorts. Um, but now we need to start planning again and start saying, right, in six months time, where do we want to be? Or in three months, what do we need to bring into the business now? So we're actually, a few people have taken early retirement, a few people have taken redundancy. Um, but we are now actually employing people again as well. And because the the, the, the business has shifted, 
uh, into different areas or we want to strengthen different areas, then look, really, we need somebody in there to drive it now and try and push through. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, it's fantastic to hear that there's a positive. I mean, I've heard a lot of positive stories in the last couple of weeks, and the volume of new stories coming from family firms has really grown. So, I think it's, it's fascinating listening to you and that you've pulled together. But, but I've also heard a lot of people saying they've used a little bit of time, and okay, financially, businesses have been hit, and, and yeah. you can't ignore that. But actually, a lot of business owners will say, actually, we never have time to focus on the business and the strategy and, and, and press a pause button. So, I yeah. guess one of the positives, in a way, is, is that it's given people time to pause and reflect. And as you say, focus on the bits that are doing well and focus on making those continue to do well and then yeah. making some strategic decisions. What sort of new skills are you looking to bring into the business? Well, we've got, I mean, the, the, we've had a few successes. I mean, the wood shop is one in particular. Um, they got brought in for, let's call it PPE um, and for the COVID cars. Um, and... It's quite a staid area of the business up to all this because they've always built the round top machines. They've always done it a certain way. Um, myself and Kath have been going in for the last 12 months really saying, look, we need to look at how we're, we're doing this. We think if you did it this way, but we're not woodworkers. We're not cabinet makers. We just look at it from the outside and, well, why do you do that? But Which we do with every part of the business. And... <sighs> There's always in the there's always up to that point being uh, well we do it like that because this is how we've always done it or so and so said this and it's been handed down yeah so our mantra if you want is look if change and if the change doesn't work great you can go back to how it was but let's just keep tweaking and I think one of the areas that really has improved since the lockdown is that wood shop because one of the products we were building. Let's just, we were building, I think the first week we built 25 a day and mm -hmm. we couldn't get above 25 a day. So we all sat down. After the first week, half the lads in the factory were about to walk out. They just said, we just can't do this. It's impossible. So we got them all together and said, right, what about if we do it this way, this way, this way? Right, we could try that. Yeah, okay. But then over the week, two weeks, three weeks, they were actually coming to us saying, right, we think if we do this, we could do it this way. By the time we'd finished after six or eight weeks, they were building 75 to 80 of these products a day, which was yeah. unbelievable. And if we'd have had it for another month, we'd have then we'd have been smashing it out of the park. So that was one area. What that then did is also it gave people the chance to look at some of the colleagues. So we've got two apprentices that started last year. And obviously they're apprentices. They were 16, 17 when they started. They're both now building jukeboxes themselves because it's given people the confidence around them to say look they did a great job during this period or we now know that we've got to start giving people another chance or letting people have a go and if they make a mistake that's fine we can reel it back yeah. teach them etc so that's an area where we really excelled I'd say in the last six months so that's what we're looking at doing now. So we're bringing more, we want some more apprentices. I need one for our accounts division, which obviously it's nothing to do with bolting bits together, but it's still an important part of the business. Um, we've got somebody joining in the technical division, what we're classing as the repair shop for refurbishing the old machines, because what we have seen is over the last six months, especially while people have been locked at home, the jukeboxes have been turned back on where they've maybe not been turned on for a while. So there's there's machines that are 30 years old, 40 years old, 25 years old, now being switched on and there's a tube out or they've decided that now they want it refurbishing. So they'll send the cabinets in. So we're setting people on in that area as well. Okay. So we need somebody in our stars division, uh, trade counter. So we're, we're now putting people into these places. We're just getting job specs written up now to try and... Um, what we're doing is rather than having standalone jobs, we're trying to merge some positions where we can say, look, we can put somebody in there that'll be able to do that. It's not a full-time job, but then they'll be able to help in this department, which will free somebody else up. Yeah. They can then concentrate on something else. So it's it's been a real interesting time. I mean, I won't say people haven't been pulling their hair out as well at stages, because I think like once again, like everybody else that's been affected, we've all ended up doing two or three jobs where we'd be doing one. And, you have to do anything you can to to get through the day and get the machines out of the door yeah in terms of managing that time then chris in terms of you personally you work with your wife so yeah. 
you obviously live with your wife. <laughs> wife <laughs> yeah. Going down the wrong path here. But how do you manage that family business? So that it, has family been, the business all been all consuming for the last six months? How do you get a break? How do you as a leader in a family firm give yourself time and be nice to yourself, to give you time to be focused 100% when you're at work? Do you have time to separate and, and do you have time to take time out? I think normally we do. Um, I think the last six months, a, because, as I say, Michael, my brother, is diabetic. He's been working from home for him and he's been self-shielding a long time now. And he's working from home now still. Um, so we've not seen much of him. He's been in maybe half a day a week just to call in and see what's going on. Yeah. Um, me and Kath have been working 15 hour days. We've just had our first two days off, Friday and Monday, uh, because uh, Kath decided we were moving house. So, <laughs> so we've done that in at the same time. So we had Friday and Monday off to try and prepare for that. So, which was good because. So who's uh, the boss, Chris? Pardon? So who's the boss? Oh, we'll. Uh, you don't have to answer. That. You don't have to answer. <laughs> we'll share that. Uh, but yeah, look, it's. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking this weekend it'll be time to get out on my bike again and do that. But look, it, it has been hands on. It has been full on. Um, we have we, we've blown our minds this last six months. Um, we know you shouldn't do it, but when things are changing so fast, um, and especially with the pub side of the business, because every week we get up and there's a new set of rules. So it's really it's, difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's like when, when the pubs reopened, great, but then they put a ban on loud music. Well, what does loud music mean? So that's then trying to try and work out how loud is loud, who's breaking the laws, who isn't. Then they came out two weeks ago. And we went to bed on Monday evening last week and everything was fine. Got up Tuesday morning, there's been 85 decibel ruling made, which then made every pub in the UK going to meltdown. What does it mean? How loud is 85 decibels? Are we going to get shut down if we break the rules? Because you've got all the local authorities looking for any excuse to find a pub at the minute. Um, and it, it's really just been full on. Um, but as I say, it's been full on, but I quite like it as well because I was going to say, has there been any fun? But oh, it's all been fun. It is. It has. It's been exhausting, but it's been fun. Um, obviously, you've got the financial side of it where you're looking at how much you're not bringing in and yeah. trying to balance the books. That that's not the fun side, but the fun side is trying to get through it. And I think it's like we sat down probably two months ago and said, look, this is like starting a business again. The only downside, it's got the overheads of a, a big business <laughs> with all these people. And that's the hard bit. It's um, trying to control that side. The fun bit is getting stuck in and saying, look, there's an issue there and we need to solve it. Uh, whether it's on the classic side where it's getting components or whether it's on the uh, operating side and you're trying to get rid of the loss making sites as fast as you can. So it's not draining your funds. Um, but yeah, it's it, oh, it's been fun, all right. It's uh, it's it's we've enjoyed it. It's I'm probably drinking a bit more on a night than I should do, but it's <laughs> we get up every morning and we're coming back. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll get a break when it's all over, and uh, we'll uh, look, we're still here, and that's the main thing. And it's uh, I wouldn't have betted on that when I woke up from my uh, semi coma in the middle of March. It's uh, I think we've done fantastic. I think you have to, I think your family business journey and the heritage and the history that goes into each and, the, and the, I guess the passion that goes into each, making each one of those machines and I, I've seen them. I, I just want to end with one other question in terms of the diversification because I know there's one machine that I saw that, that goes to show the sort of the, the, the variety and the, and the way that you adapt to markets um, and that you make a bespoke magazine um, machine now for, for Harrods. Yeah, we do. I mean, the, the bespoke side, we've, we've been really pushing this. I mean, for people that don't know jukeboxes, there are only two manufacturers left in the world building the classic style machines. So there are other manufacturers in the world manufacturing commercial jukeboxes that go into pubs. Uh, we did that until 2016. And then we sold that part of the division or the business off um we could see or we felt there was a decline in the pub industry for people putting money in jukeboxes so we did a deal with an american business which we now um it, it was crazy there were so many people coming into the market and we just said look this is mad it's just there's too many people here everybody wants to build it for nothing there's no money to be made from a manufacturing side 
So we were approached by an American business um, who wanted to come into the UK market. They really didn't want to go head to head with us because they knew we had the name. So we did a deal with them to supply their machine. So we now sell their machine and we also support it technically within the UK. Um, from the classic side, we, um, we we just want to grow that side more and more. We want to we diversify and like there's no tomorrow we've got some new product coming out next year which is a real step away from jukeboxes as you see them now as you imagine with all the bright lights around them so we're going to a more furniture based uh, product like the old consoles but we've got some nifty ideas and it's looking pretty slick at the minute and uh, we'll be launching that within the next we'll pro we'll get launched prior to the end of this year i'm sure so there's some exciting times ahead on that side and, and it's, it's, it's actually really interesting, the positivity that you talk and the smile on your face when you talk about your jukeboxes and actually the innovation and the new things, there's always new things down the line. And, and I think you, for me, you're a classic family business. You've got lots of family members involved daily, kind of rolling their sleeves up and getting involved in all facets of the business. But but you, you're well structured, you're well governed, you're well managed, but your deeper team and your stronger, wider team is, is, is really supportive. But you yeah. still have all the energy you need to drive and lead the business forward. And, and just to see your eyes spark when you talk about the latest <laughs> developments is, is just the, the passion's in there, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is because it's it's what we do and it's it's we're always looking for that next thing. Um I think every time we've looked back when there's been a problem, whether it's a uh a natural disaster like if you want, like we've got now with the the thing when I look back, it's always been the R and D and the innovation that's got sound as you through it. Um uh, so we had the smoking ban, then we had the big crash in 2008. It's always been something when you look back that something was just coming out or something had been developed so we could roll back and go, look, we could use that now or we could move into that. And I think that's what keeps it fresh. We're not coming in every day and doing the same things. Mm. But going back to the bespoke machines, what one of the, because as I say, that's where we started and I lost my track of it, but there's two manufacturers in the world. Um, what we're trying to do is go high end. Um, we're not bothered about building the cheapest and going mass market. We want to be the best. I believe we are the best. We are getting into a market now where people are ringing up and we've just had orders for two machines from one man in Australia. And he's, he's spending £20,000 a machine, but we are building him a bespoke machine that he will have the only two in the world. Um, there are people all over the world that want something unique that, to them, yeah. that's built to their specification, that will fit in their area that they want it to be. It will be that stunning centerpiece for their room. And that's what we're doing. So we're not, if anything, we're trying to probably build less, but go more bespoke and more tailored to a customer's requirements. And we can charge a little bit more for that because they can't get it anywhere else. And that's where we are. So I've just been looking at the designs now. We've got the new uh, custom shop logos coming through and we're going to custom, when you buy the sound measure machine, now you get the classic jukebox. Well, if you are having the custom shop, you'll we, we, we're going to town on it. And it'd be like buying a, a Bentley or an Aston Martin or we, we're really up in it. And that's what we've done with the Harrods machine. That's an exclusive machine for Harrods. You can't buy it anywhere else in the world. There will only be 50 of them made. Yeah. So when it's they've sold, well, isn't it? it's, oh, it's stunning. And the nice thing is in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it'll be worth three times more than it is now, whatever. But that's not why people are buying them. They are buying it because A, they know it's hand-built, it's British, a lot of it. That's got a lot to do with it. Um, they know it's quality and they know that they can actually ring me at any time, night or day, and if there's a problem and I can go in the factory, we're sending pictures to people as we're building the machine. So if they can't get there, I've just been sending machine pictures to a guy in Mexico. I was on the phone with a guy in Israel last week. I mean, they're going all over the world and these people can't get here. And we can walk around the factory and do a, a call like this and take the laptop and say, look, there's your machine and Jim's building it or Dave's building it and they're signing it on the back for you now and it, it's part of it and it, it builds yeah. up that that um heritage if you want i think i think that's a fantastic way to finish as we're running out of time but um it's a pleasure to talk to you and i'm, I'm so thrilled that you've recovered and that the business is is it's gone 
and you're doing loads of different things. The products are fantastic. Um, and I think it's tantamount really in terms of you are a great ambassador, not just for the family business sector, but actually for British manufacturing and putting British manufacturing on, on the map. So um, to be a world-class manufacturer like you are and to be one of only two making the products that you do around the world is, is, a, is a great success. Your dad must be really proud of what he's created and, and passed on. I think we all are. And I think that's what you pick up from all the team here. They're all proud of it because they all know what they're doing. It's not something that will be in a tip in five years. These things will be handed down through generations. They will be used daily by people. The letters, the emails, the everything we get in. If you look on our, the classic jukebox uh, Facebook site, the messages we get from people and the enjoyment they get out of owning one of our machines is why wouldn't you be proud? It's uh, it's great to be part of their lives as well as, as ours, really. Chris, that's fantastic. You've been a star this morning. Good luck with the launch for the new products in general. I can't wait to hear all about them. And, um, <laughs> keep safe and well. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Bye.